I was actually in the waiting room. I just wasn't able to, to talk so I'd, I'd been muted. Um, so um, yeah, so we've heard some fantastic talks already. What I want to do now is just talk about the longer term cardiovascular effects following SARS-CoV-2 infection. So as you will have already heard from some of the other speakers, um, COVID is predominantly, and certainly in, in the case of long COVID, is predominantly a vascular disease. It, it is a disease causing inflammation and clotting abnormalities in the blood and the blood vessels, um, which then has a knock-on effect on all of the other organs. Therefore, it's perhaps not surprising that there can be lots of cardiovascular and thrombotic, thrombotic meaning clots, uh, complications. And I'm just going to take you briefly through some of the landmark trials looking at these very quickly. So the first one is a very large nature paper that came out of the States looking at the records of 12 million people. Over 153,000 of them um, had COVID. They were followed up for a 12 month period. And this demonstrated that there was a significant increased risk in myocardial infarction, which is the medical term for heart attack, um, heart failure, heart rhythm abnormalities, stroke and thrombotic death and other cardiovascular complications. This occurred not just in hospitalised, but also in the non-hospitalised, allegedly mild, and I, I don't like the term mild because I don't think COVID is mild in anybody, um, mild cases. So the compounding variables with this study, it was followed up for 12 months, so it pertains to patients that were predominantly infected with alpha and delta. We don't know if the um, adverse events are as bad with Omicron. We don't know that yet, but we certainly should be looking at it. Um, and this was done in a VA cohort, so some of them were slightly older, but there was a subgroup analysis which showed that actually these risks were present even in younger patients, even in those with no underlying health conditions. The NACME registry data, some of you may be aware of, um, in the UK and, and, and in the US, we have a database of all the ST elevation myocardial infarctions or STEMIs, which are the very large, dangerous heart attacks. Now, what usually causes them is you get cholesterol plaque disease in the blood flow to your heart. One of these plaques becomes unstable and ruptures and a clot forms over it um, and it blocks the artery and then you have a heart attack. However, in patients who've had COVID, when we've taken them to urgently to the cath labs and done their angiograms, um, in a third of women and up to 18% of men, there is no obstructive coronary artery disease. This is called Minocas. Um, and this is very, very unusual. It's normally around 5%, 30% is unheard of, and it predominantly would fit with the underlying pathophysiology of a thrombotic endothelitis. Now, this is interesting as well because it's slightly more difficult to treat. You can't treat it in the standard way because there's no target lesion. And inpatient mortality in this study was shown to be higher. Now, that could be for a lot of reasons, not just because of the Minocas, but it certainly is something that needs to be looked at. Um, a further paper uh, looking at the cardiovascular applications also printed in Nature. This was around 3 million patients over almost 300 hospitals over three continents. And ultimately what it has showed is that there are increased cardiovascular and thrombotic events, uh, predominantly in the mid and later stages of the disease. But actually there was almost more in, in those that weren't hospitalized than in, in the hospitalized group, which I found quite interesting. Um, the Swedish have had a look too. So they have had almost 9,000 patients with COVID and they've studied them and they actually studied them predominantly for around four weeks um, around the time of index infection and showed a significant increase in both heart attack and stroke. Uh, now, this is a, a US study. It's, it's a preprint, so it's not yet been peer reviewed. So we just need to bear that in mind. But it's looking at over a thousand patients. And what they're trying to do is, is get away from this concept that just because the acute illness um, it may be mild in some people that actually the whole thing is mild. I don't think there is such a thing as mild COVID, if I'm being honest, because we have no idea of the long term effects. And what this study has shown is they have taken all of these patients involved in it were non-hospitalized, mild COVID cases. Some were symptomatic, others were completely asymptomatic and their COVID was picked up on routine um, LFT and PCR screening. And what they have showed is that the major adverse cardiac events, that's, that's MACE, um, were still elevated even if you were asymptomatic from the index infection. 
and the, the, the predominantly the events were quite late as well. The, on average, 10 months, they followed people up for 500 days, 10 months after index infection. And there was also an increased risk of death, both in the symptomatic and asymptomatic COVID groups compared to non-COVID controls. Um, so moving away from the vascular complications, cardiovascular complications of COVID to the inflammatory cardiac complications of COVID. This is a paper that's just been published by Ike Nagal's group. He is a imaging cardiologist. Um, one of the things that we can see is myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. But again, this was looking at a group of patients who actually had mild COVID, allegedly mild COVID and non-hospitalized. Now they had lingering symptoms of atypical chest pain, palpitations and shortness of breath, but nothing that would trigger a routine review for myocarditis or any other high risk red flags. But when they did cardiovascular advanced image, and what I should say is the routine tests were normal, but when they did advanced parametric cardiovascular imaging on these patients, there was an increased T2 signal in the, ma in, in the uh, parametric mapping. Now, what that means is there was increased water content or increased swelling subclinically in the hearts. And this suggests that even in individuals who allegedly have not been not had an acute severe index infection, they may still be having subacute myocardial inflammation. And this is not from the paper. This is actually one of my own patients who I admitted on call. And then um, I have permission to show you these slides. So this was an individual who came in on call with chest pain um, and he was diagnosed with myocarditis. Now, interestingly, his echo was normal, but when we did his MRI, what we are seeing here, this is a, um, a T2 weighted sequence and this white bit is, is swelling of the heart muscle, increased water content. This bit here is scarring of the heart muscle. And these are these parametric mapping techniques I've mentioned briefly. And what they're showing is, is diffuse um, inflammation and fibrosis before and after contrast injection. So that's all a little concerning. So loads of people have been infected. Now, what happens if you get reinfected? Well, unfortunately the news is not good either. So this is a paper that looked at over 38,000 people that have got reinfection. Um, and it showed that in addition to reinfection causing an increased risk of long COVID, it also causes a significantly increased risk of major adverse cardiac event outcomes. So cardiovascular complications, as well as neurological complications, kidney complications, bowel abnormalities, endocrine complications, hospitalization and death. So where are we now? We're two and a half years into the pandemic. The cardiovascular risk that we know of and have documented so far shows that there is an increased risk after infection of acute coronary syndrome, MI, cardiomyopathy, cardiac arrest, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and dysautonomia, myocarditis, pericarditis, pulmonary embolus, deep venous thrombosis, stroke and TIA. But what is the potential outlook going forward? Well, we can't ever say for certain, but again, this is concerning. And the reason it is concerning is because we now know that COVID causes endothelial damage. The endothelium is the inner lining of our blood vessels. They become inflamed. That's due to partly direct viral invasion, partly inflammation due to cytokine release. Why is this important? Well, first of all, to just to say there are lots of publications confirming endothelial dysfunction in COVID now, but why is it so concerning as, for us as cardiologists? It's concerning for two reasons. Firstly, endothelial damage is a major player and a key player in the development of long COVID, which Rezia Pretorius is going to talk about later, so I'm not going to mention further. But also endothelial damage is the precursor event that causes the development of atherosclerosis. Now, atherosclerosis is the disease process in our blood vessels that causes cardiovascular disease, specifically heart attacks, angina, stroke, vascular dementia, and peripheral vascular disease. So that is worrying. So in summary, take home messages is SARS-CoV-2 is not and never has been just a cold. There is clear evidence of cardiovascular and thrombotic adverse events in acute COVID. There is clear evidence of cardiovascular and thrombotic events in the medium term for the 2.5 years that we've studied this. But there is also evidence suggesting that we may have a bigger problem and that we may have a significant risk of longer term cardiovascular complications mediated through endothelial dysfunction. And this needs urgent research.
it needs urgent research because we need to know is everybody who gets infected with COVID getting endothelial dysfunction? And if they are, is it healing or not? Because so far we have 605 million people in the world that have been infected with COVID globally. If the endothelial dysfunction is not healing by itself, I am very concerned that we are going to see a tsunami of cardiovascular complications, including heart attack, stroke, and vascular dementia over the next few decades. And I think removing all legal COVID restrictions, sorry, I don't know what's happened here. Oh, we're um, just coming up at time, so. Okay. I think this has come off. Yeah, here we go, apologies. Uh, removing all legal COVID restrictions before we understood the long-term health consequences may be our undoing. Unfortunately, we also know that reinfection worsens outcomes. And so there is really an urgent need to try and reduce reinfection on a global scale. Learning to live with COVID, knowing what we now know, cannot involve learning to accept reinfection every six months. Look, I have seen myself the torn endothelium floating around the bloodstreams of individuals who've been infected with COVID once or twice. I do not know what these blood vessels will look like after the 10th infection, and it worries me. So there is an urgent need for sensible discussions about public health mitigations to reduce the risk of reinfections, and the need for clean air most certainly has to be up there, um, particularly in schools, particularly in hospitals, and particularly in large indoor venues. There is also a very urgent need for funded research trials into cardiovascular risk going forward. But one, one of the good news is once we look at this and we need to get this funded and we absolutely have to, to release funds to do this, is that there are drugs already available that can potentially modify these risk factors and can potentially treat these risk factors and can potentially, potentially be used for primary prevention. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your time.